Hey there. If you've been following my channel from the beginning back some five years ago, you probably know that I already did a video on this car. However, there were things that I didn't talk about back then, mostly because there were conflicting accounts, even by the people who built the cars. <laughs> You gotta remember this was 23 years ago. What happened after that, in the years from around 2006 to, to 2013, here in the United States, the excitement of the Fast and Furious movies died down in a big way. First off, about 2007, 2008, there was a housing crash and a recession. So a lot of those people dispersed, went on to other businesses. Many of the movie cars would be sold off, some for super low prices. The memories of the details started to fade among most of the people who worked on that movie because they were doing more movies after that. And this includes most of the people who were intimately familiar with the cars. <laughs> For example, my boss, David Martyr, was not clear as to whether or not there was a McRig car. Even the people who built the chargers with a company called Cinema Vehicle Services, they didn't even remember it. I remember reading one of their blogs and they didn't remember. I, I kind of attributed the lack of documentation to the fog that followed the first movie and the fact that the charger was not built by Universal's picture car department where I worked in. I never saw any of those chargers until the charger lined up against my Supra at the, at the finale scene. So I did a video and then more information started coming to light in the last couple of years. So after many hours of further research, I can finally fill in some of those blanks. So I'm gonna get to that right after this message from my sponsor, Off The Record. Did you know that the average driver gets nine traffic tickets in their lifetime? Look, I'll be the first to admit that I've taken maybe a couple of liberties with traffic laws back in the day. And of course, when I got caught, I had to go to court to fight the ticket, which was always a hassle. And each time that I lost my case, it meant big fines, points on my record, and higher insurance premiums. Eventually, I realized that nothing beats having a good attorney argue your case in court. So here's what you do. You download the Off The Record app to your phone and register for an account. And if you get a ticket, simply upload a photo of your ticket into the app and you will be quickly matched with a lawyer in your jurisdiction. Your lawyer will start working your case right away and in most cases, you'll never have to set foot in a courtroom. Off The Record has a 97% success rate and a 4.9 star rating on Google. And guess what? They even offer a money back guarantee if they aren't able to reduce the points or keep that ticket fully off your record. Best of all, I've arranged a 10% discount for all of my YouTube viewers. So download the app and register using the referral code FASTLIFE to receive 10% off your first case. One of the things I missed in the first video that I did on this car is the fact that the picture car team wanted to use a 1970 Charger RT, but those cars were too rare. We couldn't find them for a decent amount of money and we had a very small budget for that movie, right? Remember that? So instead, we built a 1969 and turned it into a 1970. And as more information was circulating over the past few years, it was time to clear the air. First off, let's cover the basics. There were a total of three running Chargers and a buck. A buck car is a partially built vehicle which is attached to another vehicle like the McRig. And why do they do that? The buck is driven by someone else so that the actors can be sitting in the car and can be filmed doing their lines of dialogue or turning the wheel, playing with the radio or whatever they're gonna do for the movie, along with camera and sound equipped attached. So they're sitting in the car pretending to drive and the camera stays on them and they do their lines. That's what a buck car is. With the hero car, there were no real modifications. I mean, it was turned into a 1970, but when you talk about modification, there was no crash bracing under the hood. The interior roll bar in the Hero 1 was strictly cosmetic. It wasn't a stunt cage. It was just to replicate the stunt car. Two of the cars were built for stunts. The two stunt cars, of course, had the heavy duty roll bar in case the car flipped over on its roof. Obviously, the car that would be used for the rollover used the double hoop to prevent the roof crushing. And if you look at the movie in slow motion at that scene, you can see the car that he was driving on had a single hoop over the top, but the stunt car had two 
bars are tough. You can see that really easy if you slow it down. The hero car was built using a 318 cubic inch engine for driving. The jump car used a 440 cubic inch engine and the other cars were using 318 engines. Why? Because the cars don't need to go fast. But of course we all remember seeing that big supercharged monster that was in Dom's garage. The engine was a prop. This engine was borrowed for this thing and it was returned to the shop once it was filmed. So we put it in the car filmed and then we send it back. It was a 1957 58 392 Hemi board stroke to 445 cubic inches utilizing alcohol injection via the mechanical fuel injection setup and the intake manifold was sourced from a company called Krager. The blower or, what we, or supercharger is the same, the blower and a supercharger is the same thing, was a Mooneyham 6-7A1 with an Enderley spacer and a bug catch it. If you don't know what any of that is, look it up. The car also had Headman long tube headers with Flowmaster mufflers and not much else. The three stunt cars were utilized in the following scenes. During the climactic drag race between Charger and the Supra, one for pulling off the wheelie at the start, which was a 1969 model, another to crash into the semi truck after the race, which was a 1970 model. A third one when Dom Toretto's car slides into one of Johnny Tran's motorcycle goons. That was a 1970 model as well. So the stunt cars didn't have working superchargers. So the builders crafted imitation superchargers. They made covers to cover the fan belt of the superchargers. So you couldn't see that the blower belt is not turning. <laughs> they mounted these fake superchargers to the underside of the hood. And if you watch, the flip scene when he goes over the truck you can see the supercharger is trying to come off the hood <laughs> and you can see it's not attached to the engine <laughs> however previous uh, data said that the flip car used a 440 with no modifications and we still don't know the answer to that and talking about that final sequence the big stunt new information surfaced not long ago. I said in my last video about this car years ago, the Charger was equipped with reverse wheelie bars. These were pointed to the front of the car and were hydraulically activated. Tam Trella drove the stunt car for the jump. How did they do it? In the trunk, there was a counterweight. When the car was stationary, the weights were pushed up right behind the rear seat. And then when they step on the gas, the counterweights move to the back of the car. When you drive away, you get a suitcase in the trunk and you floor it. it goes goes all the way to the back of the car. That's basically what happened. When they stepped on the gas, the weights went to the back and now you change the center of gravity of the car. So the front end starts to come up, okay? And so to keep it stay up in there, they put down wheelie bars like this and they have like shopping cart wheels on it. And so basically he's driving the car using the rear tires and the wheelie bars have wheels like shopping cart wheels. So basically he steers the car with a brake handle and he only has to go about 20 miles an hour and they turn the smoke machine on him and, and it looks really good. He did not really pull a wheelie. <laughs> Oh my God, no! And when he hits the switch to retract the wheelie bars, the car comes down. Cut, that's it. The stunt car did survive, albeit with a lot of damage. <laughs> but believe it or not, that car got restored years later. One of those cars are now in Europe in a private collection, if you can believe that. After the movie ended, the Hero Charger was displayed outside of Universal Studios for a long time, which took a serious toll on that car. And after a few years, it was really bad shape. Fortunately, the director of the Volo Auto Museum, you probably heard of him, the guy's name is Brian Grams. He was able to purchase several moving cars, including Vin Diesel's Stunt Charger. The stunt car that he purchased was the car that rolled over at the end of the first movie I was just talking about. Both purchases were from Cinema Vehicle Services, the guys who actually built the car. On a side note, the rolled over stunt charger looked a little bit different when they purchased the car because after the Fast and Furious movie, it had been used in a junkyard scene in the movie called Herbie Fully Loaded. I worked on that movie too. A few years later, Volo Auto Museum also purchased the Hero 1970 Charger. Since that car had sat outside for so many years, Volo had the car sent to Custom Classics in Island Lake, Illinois. There, the car was stripped to bare metal and given a fresh, show-quality paint job. Volo also added a very low plastic bucket seat in the car for a passenger. Everything else was retained for originality, including the bolted-on blower for the engine. <laughs> So Volo's Charger was the only one of the three to have a big block performance built 440 engine. And I hear that this engine is still in the car today. So since Volo had this hero car, they ended up selling the rolled over stunt car 
And the person who bought the Volo's stunt car eventually also obtained the buck from Cinema Vehicle Services. The museum displayed the Charger for quite a long time and eventually sold it to somebody who was going to open a car museum in Nevada. But shortly after Volo sold the car, the buyer decided not to open up the car museum and so they sold their collection off. So, so Volo bought the Charger back. Then Volo sold it again. <laughs> <laughs> this time, the car went to Norway. <laughs> what? <laughs> These cars are disappearing. At that time, Volo was focused car sales over the museum. As their attendance started to build, they decided to put more focus on the museum as an attraction instead of solely focusing on sales. As Brian said, we were keeping more of the movie cars and only selling them to refine and better the collection, meaning getting rid of the cars that don't draw a crowd and get the ones that do. Looking back at all the cars Volo had bought and sold prior to this point, there were many he wished that he could get back. The fact that he regretted selling the Hero Charger, Volo was keen to get that car back, but knowing it went to Norway, he knew the chances of getting it back was gonna be very slim. It was right. <laughs> But by a twist of fate, the current owner wanted to sell the car. So Volo bought it again. <laughs> and the car is back in their collection as of 2024. If you want to see it, go there. That's the real one. These cars, the cars from the first two or three movies, seem to command the highest prices. I've been doing research for years. Why? Because those cars were very elaborate, very unique. The cars touched by Paul Walker and Vin Diesel usually command unbelievable prices. However, some don't. In 2022, a Fast 7 Charger sold for $93,000. That seems super low to me. Likely because the car didn't have enough screen time and the market is pretty saturated with look-alike cars. What do I mean? What's happening now is that people around the world are building replicas to make them look alike. Then they post their cars on their social media with a misleading name like Fast and Furious Charger and everybody thinks that's the real car. And before long, rumors spread all around the globe confusing legitimate movie car collectors and just making a mess of it. It happens here in the United States and in Russia and in Europe and even South America to some extent. About two years ago, I was invited to be interviewed for the Vice TV documentary on the Fast and Furious franchise. One of their researchers reached out to me and asked me to round up some of the movie cars from the first two movies and I had to tell them they're all gone. None of them are here. A lot of them are overseas. Germany, Norway, Belgium, Holland. So I had to tell them none of those cars <laughs> are on the West Coast. And he showed me a picture of a group of Fast and Furious cars and I had to break the news to him that those cars were replica cars and they were not screen used cars. I said I could get those cars because they're pretty good replicas, but they weren't interested in that. And as they keep making these movies, the cars they use on screen are transitory. That means they come into a scene they're in there for three seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, maybe two minutes, and these cars disappear. They get wrecked or they just disappear down the street and you never see the car again. How can you get attached to the car if you've seen it for 15 seconds and there's nothing special about the car? And some of these cars in the later movies are amazing. Dennis McCarthy and his team are absolutely fabulous, but I don't see them going for big money. Well, not yet, we'll see. Here's an example. In 2019, the Maximus Charger, the car making more than 2,000 horsepower, went to auction. The bidding went all the way up to $1.7 million, but the car didn't sell. The seller was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. As remarkable that car is to the average guy, it looks like a plain Jane Dodge Charger with hubcaps, which of course real people know what that car is, but you look at it, my, my dad would look at the car and go, what's so special about it? It looks very plain which is not, of course. So here now in 2024, as we await what has been billed as the last movie of this part of the saga, in the following years, there will be cars that will fetch really high prices and other cars will be marked down because they're not very popular for whatever reason. Your first clue is if somebody is selling a group of legit movie cars, you can probably bet that it's a fire sale for the seller and they're dumping the cars or the cars are just not generally popular with the public. One of those two situations probably apply. And don't forget to like, subscribe, 
and follow me on my Instagram. If you have any questions, hit me up on my Instagram through my DM. If you put a comment on my YouTube, I appreciate it, but you'd be better off getting an answer faster on my Instagram. I usually answer all the questions there. So that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.